Let's turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. As workers together with God, Paul says, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. The very fact that there is such an exhortation in scripture proves that it is possible for believers to receive the grace of God and then to frustrate it in vain. That means it doesn't accomplish the purpose for which God gave it. Paul himself says in Galatians chapter 2 that he does not frustrate the grace of God. No. There is a possibility of that if we do not understand why God gives us his grace. Paul could give that testimony in Galatians 2.21. I do not nullify or cancel out or waste or frustrate the grace of God and therefore he exhorted the Corinthians, don't receive the grace of God and waste it. Understand why God gives you grace. Later on in chapter 12, he explains how that grace is sufficient for every single need in all of our life to keep us triumphant. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under grace. Grace is meant to deliver us from sin's dominion so that we live as conquerors. And if we do not live as conquerors over sin in our life, we can say that we have received the grace of God in vain. We're not allowing it to fulfill the full purpose with which God gave his grace to us in Christ. The full purpose with which God allowed Christ who knew no sin. 521, 2 Corinthians 521, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice that word in 521, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not just that we might have the righteousness of Christ put to our account, but that we might actually become, be made, be changed into. It's speaking about sanctification in 2 Corinthians 5.21, not just justification. And that's the context in which he says, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, is the righteousness of God taking over more and more in your life? If not, the grace of God is being frustrated in your life. For he says, verse 2, at the acceptable time, I listen to you. This is a quotation from Isaiah 49 and verse 8. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. And when is this acceptable time? Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And here, he's obviously in the context, not speaking about salvation from the wrath of God, which the Corinthians have already experienced, but Salvation from the power of sin. When shall we experience salvation from the power of sin? Shall we postpone it to next year? Shall we say one day in the future, one of these days, God will give it to me? No, he says. Not even today. For when you say today, it could be tonight. No, he says now. Now means at this very moment when we hear God's word. In other words, don't even postpone it till this afternoon. Or Later tonight, now, this very moment, is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Call upon the Lord when he is near. Seek the Lord when he can be found, it says. And God is particularly near to us when we read his word and when we hear his word. And that is why the time when we hear or read the word of God is the acceptable time is the day of salvation. Right now, there's no need to postpone it. Right now, I can have faith that the grace of God can deliver me from sin's dominion. And I say, Lord, I want to trust you for that so that the grace of God will not be frustrated in my life anymore. Right from this moment, even though I may not experience that victory for some time, but I want to begin on that journey right now. I want to begin by having faith and confessing what I believe. Chapter 4, verse 13. I believe and I speak. He has listened to us at this acceptable time. And he says, I helped you. He's the one who's going to help us. Our confidence is not in ourselves. If this is the day of salvation, we call out. He says, I help you. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we can say the hour of God's grace is right here, right now. And the moment of deliverance is right now. Jesus has come, died and risen. There's no need to wait. 
Revival is not something which is around the corner that we have to perpetually wait for. It's something we can experience right now in our personal life. Revival in the church may take time to come because everyone's got to have a year to hear God's word. But revival in your personal life need not wait even 24 hours. It can begin right now, this very moment, if you are willing to respond to God's word. Paul continues the theme here in 2 Corinthians 6, 3 of the type of servant of God that he is as an ambassador for Christ. He calls himself in chapter 5, verse 20. A co-worker with God, he says in chapter 6, verse 1. And now he comes back to this autobiography of his inner life that the whole of 2 Corinthians really deals with. He says, we do not give cause for offense in anything so that the ministry is not blamed. He says, I'm very careful not to do anything that will be a stumbling block for another person lest our ministry should be discredited. If there's anything he says I do which may cause a stumbling block to another, I would give it up because I don't want my ministry to be discredited by anything I do or say. Think how careful he was not to give offense in any area concerning his personal life which would be a stumbling block to the gospel. Of course, the word of God itself offended many people. That's another thing. Paul spoke the word of God truthfully and that itself offended many. That's another matter. But when it came to Paul's personal life, what does this mean? In other words, if there was something, for example, which Paul felt quite free to do, but he felt that if he did it, it would stumble others, he would be willing to give up the pleasure of doing that so that it wouldn't cause another person to stumble. Maybe it's something he could buy and have for himself. Nothing sinful, something legitimate. But he says, I would rather give it up if my buying and having that thing would cause a stumbling block to another person. Think of how sensitive he was. That he didn't want the personal satisfaction and pleasure that came out of purchasing something if that thing was going to cause a stumbling block to another. There are very few who live by this standard. But those are the spiritual servants of God. Those are the co-workers of God. Those are the ambassadors of Christ. There are very few like that, unfortunately. But think that any one of us can be like that if we are willing to pay the price. You don't have to be a full-time worker. You don't have to give up your secular job. In your secular job, you can be a co-worker of God, a minister of God, as it says here in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, a servant of God, an ambassador for Christ. Further, in verse 4, he says, in every single circumstance, instead of giving offense, on the contrary, we seek to commend ourselves or to prove to others that we are genuine servants of God. Whatever we may have to go through, Paul had a great burden that other people should see that he's a servant of God, not by some wretched title that he had before his name, not by some Bible school degree by which he claimed to be a servant of God, not even by the fact that he could do miracles, because there were people who lived insincere lives who did miracles too. But how does he seek to prove that he's a servant of God? In everything he wants to prove that he's a genuine servant of God. How? And we can ask ourselves how. And as you look in that verse carefully, you find in verse 4, it is through patience. Notice, he doesn't say I prove myself to be a servant of God by the fact that I raised Eutychus from the dead when he fell down from the window. Or that he had people healed through handkerchiefs that touched his body and went, were sent to people who were sick. Demons were cast out when handkerchiefs that touched Paul's body were put upon sick people. And yet he doesn't refer to any of these as the proof that he's a servant of God. He says, in all things we want to prove ourselves as God's servants in patience in our afflictions. When people accuse us falsely that we are patient. In necessities. That means Paul also had hardships, physical hardships, financial hardships. In distresses, he went through all types of anguish and difficulties. And in all those situations, 
he lived with patience and endurance. In stripes, that's when he was flogged by others. He didn't grumble and complain and revile them. He was patient. In imprisonments, he was patient to let God take his own time to release him from the prison. In tumults and riots, wherever Paul went, usually there was a riot because he was wholehearted in preaching the truth. But he was patient there. In the riots, in toils, in watchings, in fastings, in all these situations described in verses 4 and 5. In He worked to exhaustion. He stayed awake through sleepless nights of watching and even went without food. And in all these things, he lived in patience. And it is that patience which is the mark of a true servant of God. So if we want to be servants of God, co-workers of God and ambassadors of Christ, let's seek to acquire that patience that will prove that we are his servants indeed.